Good morning, Kirsty Strachan. You're the Gaelic Development Officer for Fife Council. And just for, for people that don't know, what is Gaelic in Fife? Gaelic in Fife is Fife Council's support to the Gaelic communities of Fife and to help uh, promote Gaelic language and culture in Fife and those that are trying to find their way to the language and culture in Fife as well. So a few different communities um, work into our Gaelic language plan um, and we're on our second language plan now and we've been working to support Gaelic in Fife for about five years now um, and of that I've been in post for about four. And for people that, that don't know because a lot of people's perception could be that when you think of Gaelic it's something that's very strongly linked to the Highlands and Islands for example but how strong are the connections um, between Gaelic and, and Fife? So um, at the last census returns we have over 4,000 Gaelic speakers in Fife um, or people who admitted to being Gaelic speakers, and we know a lot of learners didn't include themselves in that, which means um, we actually have more Gaelic speakers in Fife than there are in Inverness, which is one of the strongest kind of footholds of Gaelic in, in central Scotland. Our place names, um, we have around 78% of the place names in Fife are Gaelic, which means we have more Gaelic place names in Fife than there are in Perth and Penost or on the Isle of Lewis. So chances are, wherever you are in Fife, you're living in a Gaelic place or right next door to a Gaelic place. And even more recently, we have strong connections between people from the Highlands and Islands with Gaelic coming through into Fife through various generations, whether that was with the Herring Fleet, with the mining, um, or even as recently as um, sugar beet workers coming to Cooper. Um, so a lot of guys who are working in the sugar beet would come over and winter in Cooper and do jobs in factories and things in Cooper and then go back to Lewis in the summer to work in the sugar beet again. And that was right up to the 60s and 70s. So there's a long history um, between Fife and the islands in particular. In terms of maybe examples of specific place names or obviously something that I'm interested in, hill, hill walking, what examples are there of Gaelic names and in, in places in the landscape of Fife? Um, it, it's hard to just pick one or two. Um, the easiest one is Benarty, um, so Bain for hill or mountain and Ard for high and it's the high mountain and if you look at Benarty in the landscape it is the highest point all round about and it's really quite significant in the landscape there. So um, although there's another, you know, Bynard uh, elsewhere in the Cairngorms, the one here is significantly smaller, but it's the highest point around here. Um, you're also looking at places like Ochtermachty. Um, so Ochtar comes from Uchter, um, which is cream or something that rises to the top. And Machty comes from Much for pigs or, or possibly wild pigs. So you're the upper place of the pigs is Ochter Machti. Um, and you can start breaking down all the place names into that. And sometimes they give you a wee insight into the history of the place as well. So Mark Inch, uh, Mark Oog is the old Gaelic word for a kind of thoroughbred horse. So like a posh horse and Inish or Inch, we have the inches in Perth that people will be familiar with. Uh, Inch, Inish tends to mean an island over on the west, but here it can mean like a meadow or a kind of designated area of land. So Mark Inch becomes the kind of area of the posh horses, which kind of doesn't make any sense on its own until you realise that Mark Inch was the medieval capital of this part of Scotland. And it was where all the kind of judiciary uh, decisions were made at Dalginch Hill at the back. And the nobleman had to travel to Dalginch on foot. So Mark Inch became the stabling place for all their all their posh horses. So it was the kind of Dakota Hotel of its days with the, the kind of BMW and Ferraris outside was Mark Inch. And, and that's how we've got that place name there. So it's a great way to kind of give you an insight into the landscape or the history of a place um, or how people interacted with it as well. A lot of people, Scots, is a really important language to them. It's something they want to get a, a bigger profile of, and um, the same goes with Gaelic. So how do you work 
with people that want to promote Scots and people, someone like yourself that's want to promote Gaelic? How does that go hand in hand? Um, I would I would consider myself a Scots speaker first and, and foremost, and a, and a Gaelic learner. I'm very much still a learner, and I think the 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 challenges to both languages uh, are very similar. In terms of uh, Scots, we have people recognising that it is a language in its own right and, and not a, a dialect or, or bad English. So there's a level of kind of raising awareness and helping people understand the rich diversity of the language and, and their connection to it. And that's the same as we have to do in Gaelic, especially in the East, is kind of say, well, we are five, we have Gaelic. Uh, but there's so many shared connections and words we have so many words in scots that come from gaelic and we're starting to see more gaelic words that are coming from scots that we're kind of influenced in that way as well now and i think the more we move forward we have to start looking at scotland's indigenous languages and i would include cant and bear Liriger and british sign language in that as well because the the barrier space in us all are all the same and the more we work together the stronger we all become. Um, as a community worker, first and foremost, to me, that, that just makes sense. Uh, and people who are interested in one language tend to be interested in all languages. And they're all making up the fabric of Scottish heritage and Scottish culture. And you can't really consider Scottish culture generically without including Scots and Gaelic. And if you're going to include which we should be doing more awareness on travellers and the, the, the issues affecting Indigenous travellers historically and, and currently, then we should be looking at Kant and Bjarne Rigger and the rich heritage of songs and stories that they've contributed to all of Scotland as well. So it's, um, it's a bit of a cliche to say that it's a tartan, but it, it is, you know, all, all the different parts make up the tartan and, and that's the way we have to look at it moving forward, I think. Firstly, for people that would have the argument that in Scotland and the UK we speak we speak English, that's that's our main language, and say that it's a waste of time, for example, to to try to study other languages, including Gaelic. What would you say to, to someone that take that takes that that viewpoint? I think that viewpoint tends to be taken by people only have English and don't necessarily speak up any other languages because as soon as you speak another language you realise that it's not just a different word for cup or a different word for table, it is a, a different way to express the human experience and to view emotions. So an example is Gaelic is a very passive language and there's not really a word for like having something. I don't have a dog, there is a dog at me. Um, I don't have a cup, there is a cup at me. And that then shaped how you view objects. And typically, um, you know, Gaelic speakers are more likely to view possessions as mutually owned because of that. It's a really simplified kind of explanation. So I think when you kind of dismiss languages you're dismissing different ways of viewing the world and different ways of, of kind of experiencing and expressing the human condition but ultimately I would say you know we have tigers does that mean it doesn't matter if the Scottish wildcat becomes extinct no you just wouldn't they're, you know they're different creatures um, there's a, a beautiful expression that uh, kind of roughly translates as that a country without a language is a country without a story. And even speaking English, there are so much Scots in what we use every day. It's actually very few people in Scotland speak correct English in kind of using English terminology. We naturally use kind of negative questions and things that come out through Scots and just different, you know, turns of phrase that are from Scots. And they are so inherently part of who we are and how we view our culture and, and people. So I, yeah, I, I struggle, I do struggle to kind of understand that 
perspective. Um, but the more we kind of try and share awareness and different points of view, I think the, the fewer times we tend to hear that argument. Yeah, why, why is Gaelic worth preserving? <laughs> why is Gaelic worth preserving? Um, I would say it's not worth preserving because it doesn't belong in a museum. It's not something that is a fixed point in time that we then protect and bubble wrap and, and save on the shelf for Christmas, that kind of thing. But it is worth um, people living in and working in and using and and playing with. And you know, Gaelic is a living language and it will change. And that's difficult for some people who have been working in Gaelic for a long time to see it being changed by lots of learners coming in and I, and I really appreciate that. Um, but it is a living language um, and it is such a beautiful way to, to view the world. Um, kind of coming back to, to your hillscapes, in Gaelic there's no, no natural word for landscape because the idea of the land as something external to people that you kind of view, but you're essentially not part of, is a totally alien concept. The, the land only exists in its interaction with people and we only exist in our interaction with the land. We, you know, that is such a beautiful concept that doesn't exist in English. It doesn't really exist in Scots either. And we would lose that if we lost Gaelic. Um, we would lose our understanding of hellscapes. We would lose, we would just lose so much that, you know, nobody would ever dream of saying, you know, it's okay if a species of animal dies out, it doesn't really matter because we've got another one. So why why would we buy that a language, which is essentially the, the kind of expression for the whole culture? And Kirsty, why are you so passionate about Gaelic as a language? Um, I think... <sighs> I, I grew up in the, the generation where Ron Rigg first kind of crossed over to mainstream music. And that was the first of me really becoming aware that there was this other language going on in Scotland that I wasn't a part of. And it took nearly 30 years for me to be able to kind of actually engage with Gaelic learning um, because being an East Coast kid, there just wasn't those opportunities round, round about to really engage with it. I don't have anything beyond high school French. And so I, I was one of the people who thought, you know, the word for cup is just different in different languages. I didn't appreciate that. It was a totally different way of viewing the world and expressing yourself or that when you start to process the world in a different language, there is a different facet of your own personality comes out because it's, it's just, different. Um, I love the links between Gaelic and the landscape. I love history, so I love being able to better understand the relationships between key historical figures that we don't even realise are actually Gaelic in context. So looking at people like Malcolm Canmore and the Thames of Fife, these are all Gales. You know, these are not East Coast kids coming in. These, these are all, you know, you're looking at Malchulliam, eh, Donachug, eh, Dool, you know, these, these are gales that are existing in Fife and, and making a significant difference here in real terms. And it just feels like you become, I don't know, you become aware that you've got this special looking glass that you get to see the world in a slightly different way. Um, I was speaking to a colleague the other day and, and we were seeing you know, the part of the landscape that we were talking about had a load of Fianna tales about it, that there was a uh, oyster catchers there. So we were aware of all the stories of St Bride that were connected with oyster catchers. She was able to share a song that was connected with that. And you just, it's like opening this, this wee treasure trove that you didn't know existed because you're able to operate in, a, in another language as well. So it's it's an incredible gift to have, I think. 